Right, this morning we jump into our penultimate life hack through the book of Proverbs, and we are going to be talking about money. Just in time for some of you as you prepare to go on your summer break. You're welcome. Now, uh, Ilse, if you're joining us for the first time, or you, you know, you're kind of coming back to church, or you're kind of checking out this whole church thing, you're probably thinking, great, this is the exact reason why I don't come to church, because they're always wanting your money. Uh, if that has been your experience, I apologize on behalf of those uh, churches if that was their motive. My goal this morning is not to get you to give toward my private jet. I don't have a private jet. Uh, my goal is not for you to give to our fancy building. We rent a school hall. Uh, my goal, as has been the goal of the entire series, is that we would live God-honoring lives. And that includes how we manage our finances as well. So when it comes, though, to money, we as Christians included, we, we kind of do some strange things. I remember listening to Mark Driscoll a couple of years ago speaking about six money personalities. I like to call them six money disorders. The various ways that money affects us or, the, or various ways we allow money to affect us. And the first one is the hoarder or the, the, the greedy person. This person says, money gives me security. In other words, the more I have, the more secure I feel. The problem this person faces is when will enough be enough? Or what amount will make him or her feel secure? I mean, which comes first? The feeling of security based on some sort of amount in the bank account or attaining some sort of magical amount that's going to lead to a feeling of safety and security? The problem, no matter which way you look at it, is, is that it's always going to be a moving target. I mean, you might feel secure with the amount that you have, but then maybe due to some sort of economic downturn or, or a sudden increase in inflation or maybe some sort of emergency, you found yourself scrambling for that magical amount again. The problem with money is that it is at the mercy of the economic elements of the world that we live in. And so therefore, the hoarder will never find rest and never find security. Number two, you get the spender, and the spender says, money gives me rewards. And so the spender, in other words, is, is constantly justifying either to themselves or to their spouse or to their friends why they deserve something. Like, I worked hard, I deserve this, or I've been through such a tough time of late, work is stressing me out, the kids are driving me up the wall, and summer camp is a long way away, and so I deserve some r and R. I need some retail therapy, or whatever it might be. Unfortunately, you have to keep spending because the reward or the comfort is short-lived. Then you get the avoider, and the avoider says, money and bills stress me out. And so this type of person avoids taking responsibility for their decisions, particularly around their finances. And so either they spend money left, right, and center without considering the consequences, or they procrastinate to such an extent that they're always late in paying their bills. The school is constantly hounding them for their school fees, or CUC is threatening to shut off their power. And they have no idea what's happening in their bank account, and the word budget is a swear word to them. Then number four, you get the hater. And the hater thinks money is evil and dangerous. And so this person may feel like they're, they're holding to strong ethical convictions, but it's those closest to them who are suffering. And you, you may have your convictions about money, it's bad and it's evil and paying taxes to the man, you're just part of this institution and you're just giving all your money to it. But at the end of the day, you still need to put food on your table and, cl and clothing and, and a roof over your family's head. Money in and of itself is not, is not evil. It's the love of money that is evil, according to 1 Timothy 6.10. Then you get the manipulator. And the manip manipulator believes money buys me influence and control. This is where someone will happily lend money, but then use it to control or have influence in the relationship or organization. You know, you hear of these horror stories of someone donating a sizable amount to a nonprofit organization or a church only to use it as a way of gaining control over the direction of that organization or, or the hiring and the firing of certain people. 
And then lastly, you get the show-off. And the show-off believes money gives me status through possessions. The more I have, the more highly people will think of me. Unfortunately, all of, the money, of all the money disorders, this one can easily be seen for what it truly is, and that is insecurity. That this person doesn't have, a, doesn't have root within themselves, and they have to find it in other things. And I'm also willing to bet that many of these money disorders were involved in all of the economic recessions that we've experienced throughout world history. Steve Cyrinovic uh, wrote a paper entitled Greed, Capitalism, and, and the Financial Crisis regarding to the, uh, the 2008 financial crisis. And he says this is in his introduction. He said, greed by the managers of financial institutions led to easy loans with little to no payment, down payments. Greed by homeowners led to the purchases of houses they couldn't afford. Greed on Wall Street led to the creation of clever new financial instruments like mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps. Greed by CEOs led to corporate extravagances and ridiculously high executive compensation packages. Greed by consumers led to excessive use of credit cards to buy things now rather than wait till they earn the money to pay for it. And so he speaks a lot about greed here, but I see evidence of the manipulator, the spender, the avoider, the show-off. And it all culminated in one, of, in, in, in one of the greatest financial recessions in history. And if we're honest with ourselves, we as believers, many of us fall into these disorders or these categories. Maybe we are different ones at different times depending on the situations and the circumstances in our lives. So the question then is, how do we glorify God with our money? How do we glorify God with our finances? Is there a life hack to manage our money for the glory of God? One that will help us overcome these disorders that we can so easily fall into, uh, that we can so easily fall into these traps. And I believe there is, and it can be summed up by one word, and that is stewardship. The life hack that is going to help us glorify God with our money is by being good stewards of it. It's a good old-fashioned word that no one really uses anymore. Maybe that's why we find ourselves in financial difficulty. But today we, we use the word manager maybe instead. But just to get a little nerdy on you, the Greek word oikonomia literally means house law. You know, there's, what is the law governing a particular house or a particular enterprise? And then we further interpreted that word as economics and stewardship. So economics and stewardship go hand in hand. In other words, a steward or a manager is responsible for the economy of a household or institution, applying the house law around that particular institution. And this concept of stewardship was given to us right from the very beginning in creation. God creates man and woman in his image and then gives us the stewardship or the management over his economy or over his house, which just so happens to be everything that we can see and can't see. Genesis 1.28 says this, And God said to them, Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And here we go. And subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So clearly everything belongs to God, but he gives us the role of dominion or authority to manage it. And so we are to take what he has made, and we are to look after it, and be productive and industrious with it. I love how the late R.C. Sproul explains it. He says it like this. God installed Adam and Eve as his vice regents, that is, those who were to rule in his stead over all creation. He says it's not that God granted independent ownership of the planet to humankind. No, it remains his possession. They were not to exercise authority like a reckless tyrant who has carte blanche to do whatever, to do anything he wants, for God didn't make Adam and Eve owners of the earth. Here we go. He made them, there's our word, stewards of the earth who were to act in his name and for his glory. But here's what we've done. 
We've taken up the stewardship mandate to be productive and to be industrious, but then we've dropped the stewardship part and claimed everything for ourselves. We have become disordered. We have become greedy or hoarders or spenders or show-offs. And we've forgotten that everything belongs to the Lord and we are to manage everything that He has given us for His glory. And so, Sunrise, we need to get back to what it means about being a godly steward, a godly steward for the sake of God's glory, for the sake of our souls, and for the sake of His economy, His creation. So for the remainder of our time, let's jump into Proverbs, and let's look at four principles of what it means to be a godly steward, a God-honoring steward. I'm going to give them to you up front, and then we'll take them one by one. So here we go, principles of godly stewardship. Firstly, we need a godly perspective, especially when it comes to our finances, then a godly work ethic, then godly saving, and then we'll finish off with godly giving. So the first one is godly perspective. Now, there's nothing like perspective to help us fight off those six money disorders. Perspective or or wisdom in relation to the book of Proverbs is the ability to see something within the bigger picture. And when you see something within a bigger framework, you can then see how we are to respond and make appropriate decisions. So if we see ourselves as stewards, and that everything we have is a gracious gift from God, then we will manage it in a way that brings Him honor. And this includes our careers, your house, your car, your money, your bank account. And I know the temptation is to say, well, wait a minute. Now, I worked hard and I studied hard to become the lawyer that I am or the accountant that I am or the teacher that I am. I earned my financial position. I earned my status. But the Bible tells us that all our gifts and all our abilities are gracious gifts from God. James 1.17, Romans 12, 3 to 8 So we are even to steward our abilities and our talents and our intellect for His glory. Because here's the thing, Sunrise, when we see that everything is from Him, then we will manage it for Him. When you even begin to see that your intellect, your gifts, your talents, your capacity is from Him, you will manage it for Him. So how does the book of Proverbs help us with godly perspective? Let's look at Proverbs 30, verses 8 to 9 with me. And I I know I always say you need to have your Bibles and a Bible app, but again, I'm going to be jumping around to various Proverbs, so you're welcome just to follow along on the screen if it's easier for you. Proverbs 30, verses 8 to 9 says this, Remove far from me falsehood and lying, and here we go, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Do you see it? To have a godly perspective, God needs to remain at the center of our lives. And so the writer is asking the Lord to give just what he needs so that God remains front and center in his life. If I get too much, I might forget about you. I won't depend on you. I won't need to because I will be satisfied with what my, with what my money can buy. I will live a, a hedonistic life of pleasure seeking with whatever my money can buy. But then on the flip side, don't let me get too poor where I will revert to a life of crime and thereby dishonor your name as well. So both lifestyles have lost sight of God. And when you lose sight of God, you lose sight of your perspective. And when you lose sight of your perspective, you lose sight of the fact that you are a steward of all that God has graciously given you. So how do we keep that perspective? He tells us right at the end of verse 8, you see it? Feed me with food that is needful for me. It's such a great question that becomes a lens of perspective for us. Lord, what is needful for me? What is needful for my family? What is needful for my retirement? 
What is needful so that I don't forget you or that I don't profane your name? And the answer to that question will be different for each of us. And so we're not to compare and we're not to covet, but we are to graciously accept whatever the Lord gives us because the greatest gift is the Lord himself. Don't give me more and don't give me less that's going to distract me from you. Give me a godly perspective that keeps you front and center in my life. So, number one, perspective. What is needful for me? Next principle is a godly work ethic. And this goes back to the creation mandate. Work came before the fall, not after the fall. I know sometimes it feels like a curse, but it's not. God created Adam and Eve, and he put them in the garden to work it, to be industrious, to be productive. And so if we're going to be God-honoring stewards, we need to continue with that work ethic. Many years ago, Jay and I believed um, the Lord was calling us from Johannesburg down to Port Elizabeth uh, to be a part of a church plant. And so we left good jobs, a a nice house and a nice neighborhood, and off we went down to Port Elizabeth to serve this church plant, and we knew it was going to be a step of faith because the church at that stage couldn't pay me a salary, and so we knew we'd have to go and get jobs. And Jay, being a qualified teacher, she found a a job pretty quickly, um, not working for a prestigious school, but a a non-profit school where uh, they provided education for children who were sick and in some cases terminally ill. And so a very tough job, but a very rewarding job. And as you can imagine, also not the greatest pay. But I, on the other hand, I couldn't find a job. I sent my CV to all four corners of Port Elizabeth. I was phoning people. I was phoning up contacts. I just could not get a job. And so every day, Jay would go off to to work with such meaning and such purpose. And at the same time, friends that I had been to school with, they were crushing it in their careers. One guy had become a surgeon, and he was saving people's lives. My other friend, he became this journalist for this outdoor adventure magazine, and so he would get to drive the latest four-wheel drives and SUVs all around Africa and stay in these amazing safari lodges and climb mountains, run away from lions, and then tell everybody in a fancy magazine. And there I was hitting refresh on my email every five minutes. And if this was a chapter in my autobiography, I would have called it the big hole. I felt like I was in this big black hole of despair. Weeks were turning into months, and months were beginning to turn into a year. And so I eventually phoned up an old mentor of mine, and I explained the whole situation to him, and I'll never forget what he said next. He said, you need to work. I was like, I I know I need to work. I've just explained. It just took 10 minutes to explain to you. I can't find a job. I've, I've done everything that I can. But what he proceeded to do was to remind me that we are stewards of everything that God has given us, even when we don't have an official job. We are stewards of our time and our energy. And he reminded me of Colossians 3.23. He says this, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people or for man. And he said, you've got it all wrong. you're, You're waiting to work. You're waiting to go work for a boss, for a man. No, you work for the Lord. You are a steward that belongs to the Lord. You work for him now. And so me, being me, being a little bit slow, I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, don't sleep in. Set your alarm. Get up. Get out of your PJs. Make your bed to the glory of the Lord. Make sure you can bounce a coin off it. Spend time with the Lord in your devotion. Seek him with all of your heart. He said, you're a steward of the, of the car God has given you, so make sure it's in good running order. Wash your car. You're a steward of the place that you're staying in, so sweep the driveway. Fix what needs to be fixed. Equip yourself for when the church can employ you full time. Read your Bible cover to cover. Read books. Practice your preaching. What he was saying is have a work ethic not based on some official job 
or the required amount of hours or whether your boss is strict or not. You are to have a godly work ethic because you are a steward of the Lord's. And I'd love to say that after a month of washing my car and making my bed military style that, you know, I miraculously got this job or that the church began to pay me. No, that year turned into another year. But man, did we see the provision of the Lord in the most miraculous ways. And I learned the valuable lesson of being a godly steward. It means having a godly work ethic because we ultimately work for the Lord. Now, the book of Proverbs also gives us an example of what it means to have a godly work ethic. Have a look at this. Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 11. It says, Go to the ant, O sluggard, lazy person. Consider her ways and be wise without having any chief. So no official job, no official boss, without having any chief, officer, or ruler, no one micromanaging her, no paycheck motivating her. What does she do? She prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. He goes on, he says, How long will you lie there, O sluggard, O lazy person? Set your alarm, get out of bed, put your, get, out, get out of your PJs. When will you arise from your sleep? He says, A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want or need like an armed man. So this is a contrast between a good work ethic and a lazy person or a procrastinator. And the ant is an example of a good work ethic. Now, do they really make bread? No. They come and steal your breadcrumbs. This is an example of an anthropomorphism. Say that this week. You'll come across very clever. That's what we do. We give human-like attributes to non-human entities. But the point of this proverb is we must be aware of the seasons and work hard in those various seasons because there will be times when things slow down. Make your bread in the summer. Make sure you get your harvest in because winter is coming. Work hard now in light of those lean seasons or work hard now so that you can have rest. But the sluggard or the procrastinator has got the wrong way around. He's resting now, but unfortunately he will miss his chance to bring in his harvest, make his bread, and as a result he's going to have a very, very long, arduous, tough winter ahead. He will experience poverty. He will experience great need. See, a good work ethic understands the rhythms of life. A good work ethic also understands, also has a good rest ethic. God worked for six days, creating everything we can see and can't see, and then rested on the seventh. He didn't need to. He's God. He's all-powerful all the time. It's an example for us because we created beings, and because we created beings, we're finite and we need rest. And so we're to follow his example. We're to work well so that we can then rest well. But let's make sure we get, we get the order and the ratio correct. So, to manage our money to the glory of the Lord, we are to have a godly perspective on it. And secondly, we are to work well for it, for it which then leads thirdly to point number three, godly saving. Now, I hate to pick on our American brothers and sisters, but what I love about America is that they don't mind gathering data about themselves and then pasting it all over the World Wide Web for us to have a look at it. Uh, the rest of us are far too prideful to reveal things about our savings and our investment strategies. But according to a Go Banking Rate study, 69% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. This was, a, this was published in 2020, and if memory serves me correct, that was not a great year to have a poor savings account. Uh, it gets worse. 45% of Americans say they have no savings. So if your kid comes home from school with a broken tooth, the best advice you can give them is chew on the other side and don't smile. In the same article, they suggest you have a savings account or an emergency fund where you can cover at least three to six months of essential living expenses. 
like your rent, your weekly groceries, your utility bills. And it'll, it'll also help with emergencies like a broken tooth or a broken down car. But is this biblical? Well, let's see what the book of Proverbs says. Proverbs 21.20. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. So a wise person or a wise steward ensures they have a percentage of essential resources stowed away. And it's so important that we do because according to investopedia.com, recessions are an inevitable and necessary part of the economic cycle. History has shown that when it comes to the financial markets, what goes down eventually comes back up, although the road to recovery may be a bumpy one. But if we're going to be good stewards of our finances, then that road to recovery doesn't have to be as bumpy as it could be. The problem, though, is if we are foolish, according to this proverb. A foolish man devours his treasure and oil. And by oil, the writer doesn't mean shares in BP or, or Shell. He means olive oil for cooking and ensuring that he has food on his table. The foolish person has no self-control and spends all of his or her money and eats all of the food. They're like the spender. They're like the avoider that we spoke about in the beginning. They don't take enough responsibility for their lifestyles and their financial decisions. And so the result is they don't have margin in their life. They don't have a safety net in their life. So to be a good steward and save, we need two things. Firstly, according to this proverb, we need wisdom. The wise person will store or save treasure and oil. And the wise person is going to save and ensure they have margin uh, in their lives, a safety net. And so where do we get this wisdom from? Well, it's been the, the unifying thread throughout the whole book of Proverbs, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It goes back to the first point of putting God front and center in our lives. Secondly, then, the wise thing to do is to budget now look, I am not a financial advisor. In fact, it's quite intimidating standing up in a room full of accountants and financial advisors and hedge fund lawyers. I don't even know what that means. Like you could be a lawyer for a garden service. I have no idea what that means. That, that pays very well. But I mean, by all means, go and, and, and chat to those experts and find out where you should, how you should save and, and where you should invest your money. But for us mere mortals, one particular article suggested working on a 50, 30, 20% rule for your budget. In other words, 50% of your income uh, is to be spent on your needs or your essentials, so your rent, your mortgage, your cars, your groceries, 30% on your wants, like eating out entertainment, and 20% on savings and investments. So hopefully practical and hopefully helpful for some of us. But there is a but. If we're going to be godly stewards of our finances, there's one element missing in that. And it's an incredibly important element. Just as important as the principles we have covered, if not more. And so the last principle is that to be a godly steward involves godly giving. And God in his, I don't know if I can explain this well, but God in his divine, mysterious, sovereign ability has implanted a principle in his economy, especially his church, that if you give, you will receive. It's completely counterintuitive. Like if I give you $10, then that means I have $10 less but not in God's counterintuitive economy. It's a sovereign counterintuitive thread that runs throughout the Bible from the Old Testament right through to the New Testament. Therefore, it's a principle that has been and will continue to run until Jesus calls a time out on this current age and world that we're in. Let me prove it to you from the book of Proverbs, and then from the New Testament, and then I'll start to wrap things up. 
Look at this, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, this is the New Living Translation, says it like this, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. You see it? Give and you get. Keep and you lose. Refresh others and you'll be refreshed. Now, to state the obvious, this, this is not an instantaneous transaction. Like if I give you $10, I get this tap on my shoulder and someone gives me $20. Okay? It doesn't really work like that. Otherwise, we would be like... <laughs> The point is God sees your generosity, and in His way and according to His time, He will reward you. Now, let's jump to the New Testament. Let me show you this. 2 Corinthians 9, 67, Paul writes and says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Then he says this, verse 7, each one must give. But here's how. As he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So why do we give? Firstly, because we're stewards of whatever God has given us. But secondly, God loves a cheerful giver, as some of us pointed out earlier. But giving can be so challenging and even fearful at times. We have this fear that, well, if I, if I give, will I have enough for myself? If I give, will I have enough for the end of the month when, when I have to pay all the bills? So, cheerfulness that will trump the fear and the anxiety around giving comes from a faith in the promise that if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. So, the all-important question then is, well, where do I get that faith from? Faith to believe in that promise. Faith to take, to take Jesus at his word and, and experience the joy and the, and the cheerfulness in giving. Well, we firstly have to receive. To get that faith, we have to receive the greatest act of giving. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Paul again writes, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. So what's he he talking about? Jesus left glory. He left the eternal riches of glory where he had been for all eternity, enjoying his triune relationship with the Father and the Spirit. And he comes to his fallen creation, those who have rebelled against him, And he takes on human flesh, and not only that, but Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 7, that he became a servant, literally from riches to rags. And the ultimate way he served us was by taking our sin upon himself on the cross so that we might experience the riches that he had known for all eternity. So we go from rags to riches. We are forgiven and we are reconciled to our heavenly Father. We become spiritually rich, spiritually transformed, spiritually regenerated. And it's only out of that spiritual richness that we we can now begin to put away those six money disorders that we so easily fall into. And then we can take the step of faith and we can give. And as we give, We experience the joy of our Father and the cheerfulness of enriching someone else's life and the assurance that we will reap what we have sown. But before we can do that, before we can be a God-honoring steward, we need to receive the riches of the gospel through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Once we have that, then we can get really practical in terms of being a God-honoring steward with our finances. And so let me finish off with four practical points of application. Number one, realize you cannot take your finances with you. You're simply a steward of them while you are here. So the question you have to ask yourself this morning is what kind of steward will you be? Number two, develop a God-honoring budget. 
What budget is going to bring glory to God? And then track your spending and see if you're staying within your budget. To get really practical, automate your savings and giving. Use technology to undermine the temptation to just simply spend or to be greedy. Set up automatic transfers to a savings account or some sort of investment. And automated giving to ensure consistency. And here's where I want to get a little bit awkward for a moment. If you look around this room and you're thinking, yes, this is, this is my faith family. This is where the Lord has put me. Then if you're not contributing, would you consider to contribute towards this faith family? Would you consider to partner with us so that we can continue to do what we're doing? That we can pay the rent, pay the rent here and pay the rent for our two office units to put on amazing ministries like, like Flourish and our men's events and Kids Fest and Summer Camp coming up so we can put, uh, give our staff salaries so we can bless people so that we as a church ourselves can give to others, others in need on this island. And so our appeal to you is if you're not partnering with us financially, please would you consider to do that. We have a donation box at the back if you want to put some cash in there. But my, my appeal is grab one of those little cards at the back there that have our financial details on it. And would you prayerfully come before your heavenly father say I want to be a cheerful giver what amount will bring you joy and me joy and then set it up in a way that it, just, it automatically goes through and then lastly review regularly review regularly sit down in prayer and review how you are doing as a God honoring steward How's your heart? Have one of those six money disorders crept in? Am I showing off? Am I avoiding? Am I hoarding? Am I giving cheerfully? What's going on in here? And, and what's happened? And why has it happened? And is the budget up to date with rising costs and rising needs and your rising needs and the church's rising needs? Because here's the thing, Sunrise, and I'm done. Everything is from Him. And when we realize that, we will manage it for Him. Everything is from your loving Heavenly Father. So let's manage it for Him, for His glory and for our ultimate good. Let's pray. I'm going to ask the worship team to join me up on stage. But I'd like to pray for you in this moment. Father, thank you that you are exactly that. You are our loving Heavenly Father and you promise to provide for us and you do provide for us. And Lord, some people, I don't know, might be feeling uncomfortable around this sermon, this topic, but I just pray that you would just comfort them and give them peace. Lord, as they look to you, they would have assurance and comfort that you ultimately look after them and that they would look to you and they would thank you for all of the resources that you've blessed them with. But I ask that you would grant us a godly perspective on everything you've given us. Father, I pray that you would fuel in us a godly work ethic, a godly work ethic, not not workaholism, not stressing ourselves out, but a godly work ethic that includes good rest. Father, that you would grant us enough financial resources that we can actually save, be good stewards and save. Save for our retirement, save for our future, save for our children one day, for the next generation. And that you would fuel in, in our hearts a, a sense of assurance and cheerfulness that, hey, if we give, we will reap what we sow. 
That's the scary part, Father. So I ask that you would give us faith, faith to believe in your promises, that what I sow, I will reap. But that we are under your loving care all of the time. So I'm asking you, by your Spirit, would you work in us a faithfulness to be a godly steward for your glory and for our good. Please, Jesus. In your name, amen. I think a good way to...